Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the most commonly asked questions that I hear as a minister is this, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a question that I get from unbelievers and Christians alike. And it is this very question that Jesus addresses in our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. This teaching comes right on the back of Jesus preaching to the crowds about God's judgment in the preceding chapter. During this sermon, someone interrupts him with a tragic example of this depressing principle in action in their times. This bearer of bad news tells Jesus about the horrific incident when some Galilean Jews were killed and their blood was mixed with the blood of the animals they were sacrificing in the temple. Reading the inquirer's mind, Christ sees the question burning in the person's heart. The specific gory details of this incident are lost to history, but even the passing mention here in Luke is consistent with what we know of the savage brutality of Roman rule in first century Israel. The horrific murder of these Jews at Pilate's command is compounded in that he had their blood mixed with the sacrifices to God. To mix human blood with animal blood in a sacrifice to Yahweh would have been an outrageously immoral, unclean abomination to the Jews and would have made many in Israel hate the Romans even more. So the implied question is, why did this happen to presumably good Jews? Did they somehow have it coming? Well, we might expect a traveling preacher like Jesus, who was growing in fame and popularity, to shy away from such a controversial topic, or to offer some sugar-coated comforting message to butter up the crowd. We could expect that of many preachers in churches today of similar questions. However, not so with the Son of God. He grabs this example of calamity by the horns, and uses it to drive home a vital point in the life of all believers. Bad things will always happen to everyone, so repent and believe while you still can. Not only that, he expands it by bringing up another tragedy of his times as his own example, mentioning the collapse of the Tower of Siloam. Strangely enough, I think about the Tower of Siloam quite a bit when I'm pottering around in the back garden at the vicarage or walking on the side path to the vicar's vestry. On windy days, I look up at our huge bell tower and I whisper to God, Lord, keep that tower of Siloam in place. <laughs> Seriously though, if our bell tower unexpectedly fell down right now and landed on this church, most of us would suddenly die. Don't worry, we do have it thoroughly architecturally and structurally checked every five years. But whether it's the Tower of Siloam or the murder of the Jews, Jesus asks the same vital question and he comes to the same important challenge. He challenges his original hearers and also asks by asking this, were those people who suffered and died any worse sinners than those who survived? And the answer is no, not at all, which would have been quite shocking to the Jews he was speaking to because the commonly held erroneous belief in Israel for centuries had been that bad things happen to bad people, that bad things were a judgment of people's sins. If you've ever read the ancient book of Job, which is one of the oldest books in the Bible, you can see this theological viewpoint in full swing all the way back in the age of the patriarchs. Job had done nothing to deserve the calamities that befell him. He was being tested, unbeknownst to him, by God, via the devil, and lost his home, his livelihood, his family, and even his health in a series of heart-wrenching tragedies. When his mates come to console Job, what is their response to all of his suffering? They blame him, quite relentlessly, in fact. Now, partly, let's be frank, they're being jerks, but also... They are responding as best as they knew how, with what little knowledge they had, of what they were wrongly taught to believe about God. The Jews of Christ's time believed a very similar thing, 
And tragically, so do many Christians even today. I've met plenty of believers who've been told by well-meaning but insensitive and biblically inaccurate friends, or even wayward pastors, that their hardships are a punishment from God. That sort of thinking is destructive, and frankly, it's cruel. It's also theologically lazy. Now, sometimes God does issue specific judgments on individuals for specific things. We see this dotted all over the Bible. But these instances of divine wrath are rare, and they're usually only there to make a point of displaying God's sovereign power. Also, inherent to certain sinful behaviours are built-in consequences. That's an inescapable fact of reality. Think, for example, of alcoholism and liver damage, sexual promiscuity and sexually transmitted diseases, smoking and COPD. The list goes on and on and on. But Jesus isn't referring to these smaller and specific individual consequences for sin here. He is talking about calamities. Natural disasters like earthquakes, wildfires and tsunamis, or man-made tragedies like wars, terrorism and pollution. We live in a fallen world, an irrevocably, irrevocably broken world, which is cursed by sin and ravaged by its devastating effects. So the real question isn't why do bad things happen to good people, because according to the Bible, actually... There are no good people. Sure, there are some folks who are more obviously evil than others. Sure, some humans may live mostly good lives. But the truth is that every one of us has sinned. And because of that, we have fallen short of the glory of God. And as part of the punishment for sin, we must die. Depending on whether or not we have accepted or rejected Jesus after we die... We shall be ushered off either to eternal paradise or eternal punishment. The world is chock-a-block full of tragedies. We live in such an age now that it can be depressing because we cannot escape hearing news of events from all over the planet via the television, radio and the internet. Jesus takes just two tragic examples of his time and he uses them to issue a dire warning. Repent or perish. The real question we should ask ourselves when bad things happen is why do good things happen at all to such bad people? God would have been quite justified, really, in wiping out humanity for our wayward sins. Instead, he lovingly made a way for us to be saved through Christ and mercifully allows us time, time to choose Christ and live. Even though life on earth can be tough, there is an astounding amount of blessings poured out by God on sinful humanity, evidence of God's mercy, love and patience with his way with children. Chief among these blessings is time, time to amend our lives, time to repent and to put faith in Christ for our eternal salvation. This is beautifully illustrated in the parable of the fig tree from verses uh, 6 to 9. The tree represents a human being. It does not bear the fruit of faith in Jesus. And the vineyard owner questions why he bothers with it. This is a stand-in for our Heavenly Father and his perfect righteous judgments. But the gardener, who represents Jesus, suggests delaying the judgment to give the tree another shot at producing fruit, digging in and putting fertilizer to give it a chance at growth. This reveals God's merciful heart, his patience in waiting for sinners to repent, and his many efforts at bringing people to faith. But he will not be patient forever. The Bible says the Lord is slow to anger, not that he never angers or passes judgment. And in time, if the tree does not bear God's fruit, his judgment will fall. Because of sin entering the world, all human beings inescapably must die and face judgment, as the author of the Hebrew wrote. And therefore, every single millisecond an unbeliever has on earth is an act of divine mercy, as God gives more opportunities to repent. If every single one of us is going to die in one way or another, then it means that our lives are short, fragile and finite. There is an urgency to choosing Jesus and being saved, because we don't know how long we have left to live. 
Just as there is an urgency in those of us who have been saved, warning others and sharing the gospel with them. The most loving thing we can do for another person is to tell them all about Jesus and the free gift of salvation he has extended to them if they are willing to accept it. In Christ Jesus, we have the blessed assurance of eternal life with him in paradise, and we are the bearers of that precious gospel message to the world, which is the most important information anyone can ever hear. The people killed by the collapsing tower of Siloam, or the murderous rampage of Pilate, or the 9-11 attacks, or the coronavirus, or the war in UK, Ukraine, or any other terrible suffering, they didn't die because... They're somehow extra wicked. They died because, well, we all have to. That is God's just punishment for our sins. And the only way to turn death into a gateway for eternal life, instead of being a path to the open moors of hell, is to repent of your sins and to believe on Jesus for salvation. Of course, we Christians should lament the suffering and tragedies of this broken, sin-sick world, and as spirit-filled Christians, we should do everything in our power to help alleviate suffering, to promote what is good, to oppose evil, and to share the good news. When these inevitable tragedies happen, we Christians ought not be backwards in stepping forwards to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in the midst of dark times, the light of the gospel shines brightest. I remember during the first lockdown in 2020 when the predictions about the severity of COVID were much more extreme than things actually turned out to be. People were understandably terrified. This existential dread of our mortality moved uh, one in four Brits to engage with an online church service. Now that's actually an astonishing leap considering the latest statistics show in normal times only about 9% of the British population actually regularly attends church. I remember remarking to Kat that given this free-fall decline, if the C of E didn't seize this opportunity to evangelise, it was very foolish indeed. In moments of crisis, people don't just want their hand held. They want to hear the cosmic truths of the gospel. They want to hear of hope beyond their inescapable death. The latest church growth statistics are still emerging following the pandemic, but I'd wager the initial evidence will suggest that churches that went public with their online worship, rather than sticking to little private groups, and paired that public online presence with a clear and bold gospel message, will have seen gospel growth following the lockdowns. Stuck indoors during the first and second lockdown with little else to do, and being a bit of a church nerd as it were, I watched all sorts of church live streams during the times when COVID forced us indoors. I viewed worship all over the globe, from London to New Zealand. And what I found was that some churches seemed hopelessly afraid to even mention the virus crisis, aside from the most insipid, generalised prayers. And they were even less inclined to use this God-given global awareness of our mortality to actually challenge their viewers, many of whom were unbelievers, to repent and believe the gospel. In the months that have passed since the restrictions eased, I've found myself wondering often, how would Jesus have responded to the coronavirus? What would his message have been on YouTube, Zoom or Facebook during the lockdowns? I think it would have been very different to the fluffy saccharine sweet sermons most online church services were pumping out. I think Jesus would have preached something very similar to his sermon here in Luke 13. Along the lines of, bad things happen, everyone will eventually die. Don't wait until tomorrow to believe, so repent now while you still can, or perish and face the consequences. The fact that bad things happen on earth shouldn't shock a Christian, because we know from the Bible how human sin has ravaged our world, making it a beautiful yet terrifying planet to live on. Bad things highlight for us the reason why Christ came to die in the first place. Likewise, we should be careful not to assume and horrible events are punishments from God. However, the Christian ought to be wise enough to know from St. Paul's teaching that God can work all things together for the good of his people. So, even though bad events occur, and as Christians we may even bear the brunt of hardship, suffering and grief, 
God can use all of it to transform us for his glory. Although never condoning evil, the Lord is so powerful, he can even use the darkest pits we fall into to bring renewal, positive change, and to train us for deeper obedience and service to Christ. I'm sure there are many calamities that God actually spares us from, but there are many more that he permits to occur through the inscrutable wisdom of his perfect mind knowing full well what we can and cannot endure in order to reshape us, to make us less reliant on ourselves and more dependent on him, and to help us to be refined so that we may offer his help to others in time of need. We must be very careful when we inevitably endure hard times, or when we must deal with difficult people, or when we are hurt, that we do not let ourselves slip into thinking that we're second-class Christians being punished by our God. Very rarely there are even occasions when godly Christians, like Job, are attacked by the devil and his minions in the course of spiritual warfare, not because they are lesser disciples, but because the enemy is trying to dissuade them as Christians from growing closer to Jesus. The problems we face in life, even calamities that we witness going on around us, they help to drive us into a desire for more of the living water of God's divine presence within us. Because... There are a myriad of reasons why bad things happen, and none of them come as a surprise to God. And no one is beyond his, not one of them is beyond his power to use for his glory and for our betterment. I think that should give us a great sense of peace when we belong to the Lord Jesus. Above all else, the greatest encouragement that I see in Scripture in response to the brokenness of the world and all of its manifold disasters is that these things should increase in us a desire for our heavenly home. As an Aussie ex expat, I often get homesick for the land down under, especially when the going gets tough in my life. I dream of the burning sun, the smell of eucalyptus gum trees, and the sound of kookaburras laughing in the morning, and the sand beneath my toes. But I know that one day, if God ever does lead me back home, I shall also miss England greatly too. Both these nations I love, however they are both fallible lands, countries like all others fragmented by the brokenness of sin. I think that when I see bad things happening, or when they happen to me and I start to feel homesick, what I'm really homesick for is my heavenly home. As someone who has heeded Christ's warning to repent or perish and place my faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. Every time I see a tragedy in the world, I yearn just a little more for heaven, where there are no tears, no suffering, no death, where we shall be face to face with our beautiful Lord forevermore. And the best news is that for those of us who love Jesus, even the worst tragedies of this earth will be erased from our minds as we bask in the unending presence of God in heaven. This is our concrete hope and the reality of our eternal home. So no matter how hard the going gets, we have a gospel to proclaim and we have the promise of peace everlasting through our faith in Jesus Christ. In the glorious name of God, who is eternally Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.